Here you can see that we have this Win32 window hosted in our WPF application. But because we are on Windows operating system, even this WPF window has a message loop. And therefore, we can use a window proc to receive messages from the message loop of whatever window this window is hosted in. And we can combine these two to handle resizing. Let's have a high level overview of the asset pipeline. The content that's used in games is in most cases created using a content creation tool. Although game assets can also be generated procedurally, as we'll see later in this video, most of the content in a typical 3D game is created using software that's best suited to create that particular type of content. For instance, Maya, Blender and 3ds Max are used for creating 3D models and animations, and Photoshop and Substance Painter for textures and images. The list of tools is of course endless, but these are just a few examples. Although the files that are created using these tools can be loaded directly in a game engine, they are in general not in a format that's best for use in a real-time application. And that's where asset import and conditioning come into play, the sole purpose of which is to convert the content into assets in a format that's usable by the game engine. In Primal Game Engine, we will have the following asset types. Animations, audio, which can be sound effects or music, materials, which are basically a collection of textures and shader code to be run on the GPU, Meshes, skeletons, and textures. Some parts of the asset pipeline are of course used by all types of assets, but the import and asset conditioning is mostly unique for each asset type. Therefore, we need to start with one of these assets to lay out the general path that will be taken by any type of assets, and then we can reuse parts of that asset pipeline. And today I would like to start with the geometry pipeline. Looking at the geometry pipeline in closer detail, we see that the geometry can be imported as 3D models that are created by a content creation tool. And to do that, we will have an importer. And when we imported the content file, we'll send it to processing and packing, which in turn will condition the assets into a format that can be used by the game engine and send it to the level editor so it can be saved as an asset file. But as I said before, geometry can also be generated procedurally. And that's a faster route to set up this whole pipeline instead of writing an importer. Because that one is specific for each kind of content file that we want to import. So the whole purpose of this geometry pipeline is to get the raw content and condition it into a brilliant asset that will make our engine very happy to use it. So where I'd like to start is to define various kinds of primitive meshes. So I'll start with a plane and then a cube and a UV sphere, which is just a regular sphere and an icosphere, which consists of regularly distributed triangles, a cylinder and a capsule. If you would look at this game character, the farther this game character is from the camera, the more pixelated the rasterization of that game character will be. So we can see that here we have four levels of details in how far this character is from the camera. And when we look at the meshes in each level of detail, we can see that we can have like three different meshes for the highest detailed model. So the designer of this character would like to use three different materials for the face, the body and the helmet. And if this character is a bit farther from the camera, you can see that maybe we would like to use two different materials because the face doesn't really need that much detail anymore. And the next step would be maybe a model that has less details on it. As you can see from this outline of this character, it's less detailed. And finally, when the character is quite far from the camera, maybe we don't even want to use two different materials. Uh, maybe it's just the head of this character textured over a solid opaque 3D model because we couldn't really see any difference between a transparent and a non-transparent object when this object is that far. So this is the purpose of the list of these levels of details that we have here. So right now the processing stage consists of two parts. The first part is to determine which edges should be soft edge and which ones should be hard edge. 
And as you can see here, depending on what smoothing angle we give the processing stage, it will create soft planes for us or hard edges. And the idea behind this is that we have a position vertex, as you can see here in pink, and that represents just one point in the 3D space. And this point is referred by multiple triangles. If each triangle has a different normal here in green, you can see that different points can have different normals. And what we do by this smoothing angle is to tell the processing stage whether to split this position vertex into two or keep it one and then take the average of the two normals. In the first case, when we split the position vertex into two, then we effectively have two separate triangles with different normals, and that results in a hard edge. And when we average the normals and keep one position vertex and one normal, it will result in a soft edge. So that's the responsibility of the normal processing stage. And we can do the same for the UV coordinates. This same corner of this cube, point A, will be mapped to different points on the UV plane. And when that happens, we also need to split the position vertices in two. And later when we have tangents, we need to do the same. And there are more stages in processing that we will be doing later when we have like an importer for our 3D models then it will be justified to do full processing on our vertices. But right now, these two will be all we need to do to get something out of the geometry tool chain. So as you can see here, we need to basically write two functions that do this for us. Our processing stages have some preconditions. As we discussed before, vertex processor conditions are as follows. The vertex positions should be unique except when we want to coerce hard edges. Because the processing stage doesn't merge any position vertices, it only splits them. When we have non-unique position vertices, no matter what smoothing angle we give the processing stage, it will always result in a hard edge. But if we really want to control the hardness of the edges by the smoothing angle, we need to give it unique position vertices. So for example, if you look at the top plane of this cube, you can see that, well, the cube as a whole has eight unique position points and we can create triangles for those. And if you look at the top plane, you see the triangle one, four, two, because we are winding counterclockwise so that our normal in the right-handed coordinate system will point upwards. And the second triangle is two, four, and three. And for each of these triangles, we need to provide three normals. So for the first triangle, we have normal one, two, and three, and normal four, five, six for the second. And the same thing holds for the UV coordinates as well. And that's why we are going to calculate the normal at each index instead of have a unique normal for each position vertex. With the smoothing angle, we just tell this function which angles should be considered soft and which angles should be considered hard. So when we set the smoothing angle to 120, for example, we need to account for each direction for the angles. So we have reflex angles and obtuse angles. In this case, this one is a reflex angle and this one is an obtuse angle. But this could also be a acute angle, which is less than 90 degrees. But we can account for all of this by just one smoothing angle, because if you look at the cosines of these angles, you can see that anything that's less than 120 degrees, so if this angle would be less, then we should consider those a hard edge. And anything that's bigger or larger, we should consider as a soft edge. And if we calculate the cosine of those angles, this relationship is flipped. So if this angle between the normals is less than the cosine of alpha, then we should consider this edge to be soft edge. And if it's larger than the cosine of alpha, which is the cosine of smoothing angle, then we should consider this edge to be a hard edge. And I'm using the cosines instead of comparing the angles directly because using cosines accounts for both types of angles. 
either reflex angles or obtuse angles. And on the other hand, calculating this theta, which is the angle between normals, is faster if we just get the cosine of this theta because we are going to take the dot product of these two normals and the dot product of the two normals is proportional to the cosine of the angle between the two normals. And that's why I'm just going to use the cosine of the smoothing angle instead of smoothing angle directly. Okay, if we look at this image again, you can see that we need to go through all vertices and see which position is referred to by which triangle. And then we need to check what exactly the normal vector is on that index for that triangle. And that means that we need to pick one position and then go through the list of indices to see where it's referred. So basically it will come down to a quadratic algorithm which is rather slow and to speed up things a bit I'm going to just loop through the indices once and see which index refers to what vertex position and just remember that and that makes calculating this a lot faster here you can see what I mean by that we have the positions and the indices and for example here the first position vertex is referred to by the zeroth and the third index in the index list so the index ref will contain zero and three for the first vertex and so for the second one it's referred by the indices at position two four and seven and 1 and 8 for the third position, and 5, 6, and 9 for the fourth one, and so on. So this makes it easier to figure out what vertex is referenced by what index.